It is a joy to be able to introduce our closing speaker uh, for this retreat, um, and I'll tell you why. But first, there is a brief announcement. I think there's one uh, cab that's leaving early at 12.50. If you're part of that group, if you could just uh, check with Meredith on your way out the door, she'll make sure that you get to that early departure cab. Uh, it's a delight to get to welcome Steve Garber uh, to speak with us uh, at AEI. I'm not sure how often he's done that, uh, but Steve is a person who some people in Washington, D.C. call a professor of meaning. He is a professor with uh, ties to a lot of people in this city and really throughout um, the kingdom. And uh, as, it, as, it, as it goes, he is um, uh, a person with a classroom among many people and in many places. Um, Steve is an expert on topics uh, that have to do with the heart and the mind and the vocation in particular. He's the, the founder and principal of the Washington Institute. Um, the heart of his own calling is, is to have uh, people um, understand the integral character of faith, vocation, and culture. Uh, he wrote the book, The Fabric of Faithfulness, Weaving to Together Belief and Behavior in the University Years, 2007, and more recently, um, Visions of Vocation, Common Grace for the Common Good, which you have, and there's been quite a bit of buzzing chatter about. Uh, he writes frequently for Comment Magazine, for Critique, uh, also has contributed something to uh, Faith Goes to Work, Reflections from the Marketplace, and Get Up Off Your Knees, Preaching the U2 Catalog, uh, as well as uh, the Mars Hill Audio Journal, Tacit Knowing, Truthful Knowing, uh, looking at the life and work of Michael Polanyi. Steve Garber was, for years, a professor at the American Studies Program, which has representation here today. Uh, he was also a scholar in residence for the Council on Christian Colleges and Universities. Uh, he serves on the board of Ransom Fellowship, Blood Water Mission, Arocha, the Telos Project, Wedgwood Circle, Murdoch Trust, and is, uh, does some work with a number of, of uh, corporations in the area as well. Uh, mentor to many in this city, Steve is a native of the Great Valleys of Colorado in California. He's married to Meg, and they have five children, and uh, our family is very privileged to know the Garber family. Uh, we think inordinately highly of him. Uh, Steve was also uh, a mentor to me early on when I came to Washington uh, right after college in 1998 for the very first time, and I think we'll be um, really encouraged by, by his remarks. Again, so many topics of public policy on a range of issues, ultimately tying to, you know, what might my role be in all of that? Uh, what is my role in terms of vocation and calling in the kingdom? And uh, we have with us uh, really one of the true experts in that area to uh, wrap things up and bring us home. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Steve Garber. I still remember being at Lookout Mountain in Chattanooga, Tennessee, many years ago now. And it was the year that Josh Good graduated from Covenant College. I was speaking to the faculty there one summer in their August retreat before the school year began. And uh, just to give you some sense of where Josh came from, on the one hand, he grew up in Annapolis, Maryland, and made his way you know, to, to the south, to Chattanooga. But after four years at Covenant College, me getting to know the faculty for a few days, it was intriguing to me to ha hear how many of them wanted to be known as Josh Good's teacher, or I really mentored Josh Good here, you see. And uh, after a while, the count seemed to be too difficult to keep up with, and I thought, well, I'm glad Josh sought out a lot of good teachers, but he probably wasn't being mentored in the same way by all of you, but they all wanted to claim Josh as being their best, their prized student. So thank you, Josh, for your gifts and your seriousness about these things. Um, we have done a lot of things over the years, and thank you for this one, too. So. I remember when I was teaching at the American Studies Program, we had students who would be here at AAI sometimes, and Robert Bork was one of the scholars here in one of those years, and uh, some of you would remember the idea of being borked, you know, grew out of his own sad experience with nomination to the Supreme Court. But uh, he wrote a book called Slouching to Gomorrah after all that, and uh, our student, who was a Gordon College student at the time, was working for Judge Bork in those that semester and was one of the researchers behind that project. and uh, So I've been watching this place for quite a while. 
One of the great men of Washington, D.C. is the chief steward of our nation's intellectual resources. His name is James Billington. We call him the Librarian of Congress. For years, he has given leadership to the library, administering and the organization and collection of the books and more that are our national prize. Some years ago, I remember when he decided to bring in Václav Havel, who at the time had become the president of the Czech Republic and giving speeches in literally parliaments and universities and all over the, the world. And Billington hosted Havel for several days, invited world-class scholars, leaders, intellectual leaders, politicians to come in to be with him as Havel was the subject of the conversation. Maybe you know a little bit of the story of Havel. He was the chief playwright, the best-known playwright in Czechoslovakia in the 60s and the 70s. Protesting as he was, the totalitarian character of uh, communism that had overruled and run through by tank and gun his own country. And eventually, by the 1970s, Havel was declared a persona non grata in Czechoslovakia. He was requested, with the arm behind his shoulder, really, to go up into the Tatras and leave Prague which he did for several years, and then was put into prison for much of the 1980s. And inexplicably, amazingly, of course, 1989, when the world changed and the communist empire imploded, Havel was taken from prison, literally, and within a month made the president of, the Czechos of Czechoslovakia. Within a year or two, of course, the nation decided to go back to its own historic names and geographies, and the Czech Republic was born, as was Slovakia, re renamed. Uh, but Havel continued to be the president of the Czech Republic and began giving speeches around the world on one question. And the question was this. What are the conditions in which human beings can act responsibly in history? What are the conditions in which human beings act responsibly in history? And I have a book by that, with that topic as its thread throughout. Maybe you've seen it yourselves. It's an amazing book because really all over the world, in every kind of setting, again and again and again, whether it was a parliament, a congress, a university, he asked the same question, what is it that is required for human beings to act responsibly in history? I think about who he was and where he was. Here he is, the leader of a mid-European, Central European nation. After several generations of tyranny, the Nazis coming in with their tanks, a generation later, the communists with their tanks. Both times, the textbooks being rewritten by those who were now ruling and saying, in fact, this is our history, this is who we have been, and this is who we must be in the future. And after three generations of this, Havel realized in the 1990s, the Czech people were demoralized quite profoundly with a very small, diminished sense of the possibility of actually creating a new nation, a new society, a new world to live in. He realized, of course, what all of us know if we think about it very carefully, that somebody who has been raped, literally, figuratively, in the horrible, horrible, multifaceted way that that word has its own meaning. It's very hard to imagine a life beyond, a life outside. And he realized that apart from the Czech people recovering a sense of, I'm no longer a victim, I can somehow act into the future, there would be no future for his people. So we began to raise first internally within the Czech Republic and then all over the world, what is it that re is required for human beings to see the future as a possibility? I can act into the future. It's possible now, given even all the wounds I've experienced, given all the horrors I've known, it's possible actually to see myself as responsible for the way the world turns out. In a speech given at that gala gathering of world leaders at the Library of Congress, Havel put it like this, and it's on the outline of what you have in front of you now. Whenever I've encountered any kind of deep problem with civilization anywhere in the world, be it the logging of, rain, of rainforests, ethnic or religious in, intolerance, or the brutal destruction of a cultural landscape that's taken centuries to develop, somewhere at the end of the long chain of events that gave rise to the problem at issue, I've always found one and the same cause a lack of accountability to and responsibility for the world. If you know Havel's work at all, and in a room like this, with populated by people from Christian colleges, as we, as we call them, across America, in some ways this world and worldview is not where we live and think and move and have our being. Because Havel was not a lover of God, from what I understand of his life. I've read a lot of his work. Uh, there was not a Christian, from what I understand of his heart, 
But it was somebody as an honest human being who saw things more clearly, more starkly, saw where lines in the sand exist, where most of us, in fact, don't. And he put it like this in several ways, in many places over the course of years. If we lose God in the world, then we lose the ability to speak any longer about meaning and purpose and accountability and responsibility. If we lose God in the world, we lose the ability to speak any longer about meaning and purpose and accountability and responsibility. I've often wondered, speaking to many of your colleges over the years, watching your students go through your schools, what would it be like to have a final essay question before you actually get to graduate from a Biola on the West Coast or a Gordon on the East Coast and all the places in between? What would it be like to say, you can't get your diploma until you actually explain what Havel meant? Because if you're going to be somebody who lives in the world, in a pluralizing, secularizing, globalizing world, you're going to have to actually be able to explain what Havel meant. Because you see, it can no longer be a parochial experience. It's no longer a tribal tradition which you alone are responsible for. If you're going to be a citizen of a pluralizing, secularizing, globalizing world, you have to figure out a way to make sense of what you believe in this kind of a place, in this kind of a time. And you see, unless we can really explain after three or four or five years at a good school like you represent in this room, what Havel was about, what he meant, what the weight of his words mean. If we lose God, you see, then we lose this, and we lose this, and we lose this, and we lose this. I never was in a position to require that of your schools, but I've sometimes suggested that to your deans and professors and presidents, just saying, come on, people. If we're going to be serious about who we are in the world, we have to be serious about what the education's about. And it's so easy to assume a God-formed world, a God-shaped world, a God-believed world. But you see, most of the world doesn't see it like we do in this room. We could learn a lot from Havel. What are the conditions socially, culturally, intellectually, philosophically, even especially religiously, that make responsibility a possibility? What is it, why is it that responsibility means so much? The language of productivity that we've heard today, of course, that we're meeting at the American Enterprise Institute, after all. It matters significantly, doesn't it? Enterprise is human activity, formed as it is by the reality of human agency which is the heart of what we mean when we talk about responsibility. I've written about this in the introduction to this book you've been given, The Visions of Vocation Books. I won't tell the longer story, but just briefly just to say, some years ago I was called one, one day by a per person at the State Department. She was the China specialist there. and She said, can you come take part with me with about 25 of the leaders of the Tiananmen Square protest? They made it out of Beijing that night, and they're here in the U.S., and they want to talk about something. They have a question. She described them, interestingly, as the Václav Havels of China. She said they can't go back until things change politically, but they long to go back. They long for China, for the future of China, but they have a question, really, and they want to talk about it. So a few weeks later, my wife and I went out to this house in western Fairfax County and made our way to Hill and Dale and went into this very Asian decor-looking place. And there were 25, 20, 30-somethings from Tiananmen Square who were gathered. They were at that point doing PhDs at Berkeley and Harvard and journalists and business people across America and they had a question they wanted to ask and the question was this. You see, we love China. We actually love China. We've suffered. They told the most horrific, heartbreaking stories of holding their closest friends in their arms as they were bloodied and dying in Tiananmen Square. We've seen the worst of the world, but you see, we love China. And we have a question for you. We want something that can make sense of our longing for China, of our love for China, of our decision to someday go back to China, even if we suffer in doing so. We will do that, you see, because we love China. We want something that makes sense of that philosophically, a good reason to do something like that, a basis philosophically that makes sense of a decision to do that. We've been asking the philosophers of the world, do you have a reason, an answer to this question, and nobody's given us a good answer yet. We wonder whether Christianity is different. Does it have a better answer to this question? Now, if I've sometimes said to your faculty and administrators, 
I think they ought to be able to explain Havel to themselves before they get out of your schools. Sometimes I've wondered this way. I mean, what would you say, students that you are in these good schools where you attend, what would you say to that question from these Tiananmen Square survivors? Could you answer it? Does Christianity have a better answer to that question than the other philosophies of the world? You see, unless we can actually step into that and make sense of that, my own argument would be, what have you been learning, actually, in this school after all? Because you see, unless you can take these truest truths of the universe, which you're called to steward in your respective colleges and universities, and make sense of them in a pluralizing, globalizing, secularizing world, I wonder what, in fact, it is you've learned, and what it is, in fact, you see your own vocation to be out into the world. Well, how about capitalism with a conscience, then? This morning, I got up earlier than I probably had to because I just wanted to see my friend Helen Bekele, who owns and operates Bagels and Baguettes on Capitol Hill. Maybe some of you who are local know this place. It's located pretty cl just down the block from where the Heritage Foundation is located on Massachusetts Avenue, just on the sort of south or northwest, northeast side of the Hart Building and the Capitol, Capitol Hill. Helen is, as we heard in the immigration conversation, an immigrant come to Washington, D.C. She is, like thousands and thousands of others, she's Ethiopian, actually. Did you know this about Washington and Ethiopia? There are more Ethiopians in Washington, D.C. than any place else in the world outside of Ethiopia. In fact, if you have eyes to see this morning, the last day or two, there's a woman who's been serving us here in the building from, at AAI. She's worked here for 10 years now. Her name is, providentially and wonderfully, her name is Jerusalem. If you've watched her, listened to her, maybe you've seen what I've seen. She's remarkably attentive to you, to us. She understands something about what you might want and need, and she thinks it through, and her intuitions really are very attentive to being a friend and a servant and a, a helper to us to get this done these, these days. Jerusalem is her name. She is Coptic. She's Ethiopian. And she's one of thousands and thousands of other Ethiopians, like my friend Helen on Capitol Hill, who came here under political economic duress from Ethiopia some years ago with her four other siblings. She has run this place for years now. When I walk in, I go back behind the counter and give her a little kiss on her cheek and say, Helen, how are you this morning? And you know, I always want to pay for my bagel or in the afternoon for my chai tea latte, which is a treasure that I have in the afternoon sometimes. But she often mostly says, no, 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 Steve, you just keep it today, you know. I say, no, I want to keep you in business, Helen. I want to keep you in business, you see. Well, you know what? It's really hard to do a business. It's hard to be an entrepreneur. It's hard to actually work in the marketplace. If you walked in there, you'd see that most of those who work with her and for her are other immigrants from really probably Africa and Latin America principally. She and I talk about things as I walk in. We sit on the little iron tables outside mornings, mid-mornings, and just how are her kids doing? How's the work doing? How's the market doing here? How are you selling? Have people buying enough to keep you going? And uh, It's been impressive to me over the years just to watch her sweat her way into a, a good business. Because it really is that, isn't it, if you know anything about a business, about actually trying to take ideas and be productive, be enterprising, to be responsible in the world economically and financially, to create a business which serves all of us, bagels and baguettes for the common good and the good of our stomachs. But I love my friend Helen, and I've watched her, and I'm intrigued by her, and I wish in some ways I could figure out what resources I could help bring around. Sometimes I help with small things, but, you know, she needs help in some ways. She works hard at it. She works awfully hard at it. But she has a deep, deep sense of why it matters to get up early in the morning, to make sure that the bagels are fresh every day. This is not a Starbucks, you know, spin-off, actually. It's actually fresh bagels every day, not five-week-old, you know, frozen stuff that you think, ah, how'd you make so much money selling frozen bagels, Starbucks? Um, she makes her stuff day by day, and it's good, and it's fresh, and we ought to honor her productivity and her enterprise and her responsibility. I have another friend, Hans Hess, who grew up in Carmel, California. Wouldn't we all like to have done that, actually? Um, but he went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo 
for his university years and studied physics of all things. Got involved with a ministry that made him think that when he finished school, he ought to go to seminary. So he did the Dallas Theological Seminary and spent four years there studying theology and languages and was sure he was being called to be a missionary overseas until he finished his school that spring and began to try to raise money to do it. And he just couldn't sleep, and he couldn't sleep, and he couldn't sleep. And he began to think after three or four months of not sleeping, I probably shouldn't be a missionary after all. What am I going to do with my life? And uh, he had a friend who, in the strangest of how Washington, D.C. works, worked on Capitol Hill and said to Hans, why don't you come back here? You can probably wait, wait tables so you can get a job being a L.A. or something, a legislative assistant and, or a correspondent or something for a congressman. So he drove across America and got a little job on Capitol Hill and worked into a position where one day he was asked a question by his congressman. And the question had come from a constituent wondering why kids in America were no longer being helped as they had always been helped by antibiotics in the same way that they should be helped in the future. Hodge began to do some research on this and began to find that one of the major lines of answer to the question was this that in fact, we were eating so many antibiotics in our meat today, it just was an unhealthy meat supply, that in fact, when you need to be helped by an antibiotic, you already had too much of it in you, and it served you know, not very healthy ends body-wise and health-wise. And he took it into his mind and his heart, and about a year or two later, he and his wife, who was an MBA from, from Wake Forest, who was working for a bank here in the city, began to take a sharp pencil and night by night would think through the question, so, could we make a better hamburger in America? How about just Falls Church, Virginia, to start with? And after about a year, they got a loan from a bank, uh, and they opened up a little shop called Elevation Burger on Lee Highway, like Robert E. Lee Highway in Falls Church, Virginia. And I began to get to know Hans in those first days of being opened, and we began to be friends. And for years, he served as the chairman of our board for the Washington Institute, actually. Early on, I began to tease Hans, saying, but Hans, you went to seminary after all. Why don't you have, next to the Elevation Burger and the, this burger and the, this burger, why don't you have a, a holy hamburger? Because you see, there are a lot of Christians who like to have Christian things to buy and to eat, don't they? <laughs> and, and you laugh at that, but there are people who have come from very good seminaries to Washington, D.C. to study with us about vocation in the world and the church. And we've taken to meet Hans in his shop and Literally, they've asked this question. Hans, I think you're teasing yourself. Where are the Christian signs in here that indicate you're a Christian businessman? Come on, Hans. You're not serious about your faith. People can't come to faith buying a hamburger for you because all you have is hamburgers the way they're meant to be on the wall. I mean, so what? I mean, a healthy hamburger? So what? They're still going to go to hell, aren't they? I mean, come on, Hans. Where's John 3.16 on the wall of your, hamb of your hamburger shop? Literally, from good seminaries that you all know, people have come to our life here in the city and said to Hans, how about a Christian hamburger? I've teased Hans, actually, saying, you know, probably, Hans, what you instruct your employees to do is back behind the little screen is put a little you know, cross-shaped, you know, elevation sauce on the hamburger just to make sure that it is a holy hamburger after all, right? Well, Hans has worked and has worked and has worked. You see, like my friend Helen, you have to work really hard to do business in this world, to be productive, to be enterprising, to be actually a responsible member of the world, a responsible person selling products, which in fact serve all of us. I've told Hans, you know, many, many times, we've talked about this for years now. I said, Hans, you know, you make eschatological hamburgers, don't you? And being theologically trained, he understands what this is, but I keep poking them all along the way. Because you see, if on the one hand, the very first conversation between God and you know, our for first forebears was about what are you going to eat and where you should eat it and what you shouldn't eat and things like that. And we have long stories of manna provision and Passover meals. And the very last thing Jesus does with his disciples, of course, is have a supper together. He says at that last supper, in fact, I want you to have a supper like this until I come again. So eat together like this in this way until I come again. It's really a long history, Hans. And of course, its culmination, its consummation is in that great moment, the very first thing in the new heavens and earth, we'll be having a meal together, a marriage supper of the Lamb after all. So I said, you know, what you do, Hans, in this moment in history, in your time in, in this world, to create a tasty, healthy meal for all of us,
You see, it's a signpost of what someday will be, isn't it? I have no idea, really, I don't, though I have preferences and hopes, whether we'll be eating hamburgers in heaven, um, whether we'll be, in fact, in the new heavens and new earth having you know, the meat of this world to eat. I don't know. There are good conversations to be had about that, of course. But I know for sure that everything on the table, everything on the table will be healthy and tasty at the very same time. It'll all be that all the time, completely. There'll be no trade-offs. And so Hans to do his best, you see, in this life to create a signpost of what someday will be. It's a pretty good work to be done, actually. It's pretty good work to be done. I work for the Mars Corporation off and on in my life. They're headquartered here in Washington, D.C., in McLean, Virginia, actually. Mars, of course, if you didn't remember the name, they make M&Ms and a lot of other things that we all like a little bit of, of at least. There are two secret organizations in McLean, Virginia. One is more secret than the other, uh, ironically. The more public organization is called the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, there's a big sign out in front that says Central Intelligence Agency. Big barbed wire and machine guns, but it, it actually names itself. But this $35 billion a year global headquarters of the corporation has no sign on the building. It's simply a nondescript building in downtown McLean, Virginia. There's a small sign on the door outside Mars Incorporated with a little fisheye camera over the top of it. And if they don't know you, you can't get in. But wonderfully, once you get in, there's a cornucopia of M&Ms you know, and Skittles and Dove ice cream bars and Wrigley's gum and all kinds of stuff, actually. Um, so you know, I always try to take a, a coat with me, making sure that I can fill my pockets before I walk out that day. But Mars makes a lot of stuff. It's an interestingly run corporation, imagined corporation. It's a privately held corporation. It's a family-owned corporation. The Mars family owns everything, actually. A $35 billion a year corporation owned by a family. I make no argument that you know, M&Ms are you know, the food for the new heavens and new earth, or that somehow this is a perfect story, but a perfect people. That isn't the conversation at all we're having today. But about eight years ago, I got drawn into a breakfast in a place in, in uh, Tyson's Corner with two executives from Mars. One was the chief economist, a man named Bruno Roche. He's French. He studied in Paris. And his doctoral work in economics. Lives in Brussels now, where Mars's European headquarters is. And Bruno said to me over this breakfast, he said, Steve, I don't think the economic paradigm that runs the world is sustainable. This is eight years ago. Remember the timing, OK? What do you mean, Bruno? He says, well, if all we ask of a corporation or of an economy is that it maximize shareholder profit, it isn't a big enough question to ask, actually. There are other questions that matter, too. Like what? Well, he and I began to have a longer conversation after that morning and began to spend days and weeks and now years together talking this question through of what it means, actually, to create conditions where profitability is sustained over the long haul. Because you see, for a family-owned, privately-held corporation, they're not wanting to get out three months from now. They're not wanting to you know, make a killing in six months and then be done with it all. They actually want to keep making money for the long haul, ironically, in a Friedman-shaped economy. They ironically actually want to keep making money for the long run, over the years. I gave them an essay by an interesting guy. Some of you may like, some of you may not like him. but. I've read a lot of Wendell Berry's work in my life. I gave him an essay called The Two Economies a few years ago just to talk through you know, what it was Mars wanted to do. I said, this guy's been thinking about these questions for a long time. In an audience like this, I can say it quite plainly. What Berry argues for in the essay is this, that there are always smaller or lesser economies in the world. There's a, you know, a Washington, D.C. economy. There's a you know, Virginia economy. There's a Piedmont economy, there's an Atlantic economy, there's a US economy. You could kind of find your way along the way into all the lesser economies that exist in this world. But he said there's always a greater economy. And the greater economy is this. It's the world that really exists. You don't get to choose it. You don't get to prefer it. You don't get to want it. It actually is reality. He says, in my terms, this is the kingdom of God. But you can call it what you want to call it. But actually, at some point, you see the lesser economies bump up against the reality of the greater economy. Because in fact, they have to. Because there's no other world to live in than the covenantal cosmos of God. 
So you may imagine metrics which make sense of your lesser economy for a few months or a few years, but you see eventually it bumps up into the reality of the way the world really is, the greater economy. We went down to visit Barry one day on his farm in Kentucky. He actually is still a farmer, though he's on the one hand called the most serious essayist in America today. But he farms every day. He's still an enterprising, responsible citizen of his town and his state. And, uh, at the end of the day, he put it this way to us. He said, you know, if you want to make money for a year, there are certain questions you have to ask. If you want to make money for 100 years, there are other questions you have to ask, though. And I would say over the last six or seven years, I've been part of a conversation with the Mars people asking these other questions. Last summer, about this very time in June, I was invited to go speak to their think tank, the Catalyst Group, they call it, at a beautiful chateau outside of Paris. It was beautiful, I would say that to you. There were chefs on the grounds, and you know, they made wonderful things to eat and imagine all day long. And I walked out one day in the middle of the afternoon to this platter of pink things, and I thought, what on earth are these pink things? And I said, what is this? And the person said, they're marshmallows. We made them in the kitchen, of course. I said, you make marshmallows like this? I've only ever seen my whole life in a plastic bag, and you made your own marshmallows? But it was a very beautiful place to be. I was asked to speak on one question. On the one hand, the morning speaker was a Harvard Business School professor who was brilliant and insightful and sophisticated in her insights about the marketplace and the pragmatics of business being done in the world. I was asked to speak in the afternoon on this question. What do the words vocation, ethics, and meaning have to do with the globalizing economy? What intrigued me was to see, of course, that in this conversation created by my friend Bruno, the chief economist, there was no final tension or conflict between the pragmatics of what you could call real economic and this more principled, deeper conversation about the very meaning of the whole thing. Could we speak, in fact, honestly about moral meaning in the marketplace? About three weeks ago, I was invited to come to something at the Mars headquarters in McLean, and I have to confess it seemed to me quite a two days full of what does Jerusalem have to do with Athens conversation? Because for a, a day and a half, very bright people from around the world have been brought in to speak into the details of marketing and market sales and the markets of the world. People who know you know, exhaustively what's going on in e-commerce in China these days. People who have exhaustive knowledge of, you know, the marketplaces of Africa these days. I mean, people with sophisticated, you know, insights about psychology and sociology of marketing. And I found myself, on the one hand, feeling quite overwhelmed and intimidated, but also just completely impressed with, there are people who think about things with a great deal of sophistication in this life. And I haven't even thought about this at all, really. In the most simple terms, when we walk into the grocery stores of the world, it isn't happenstance, of course, that the Oreos are placed right there. You know, I mean, there are people with PhDs in marketing who actually made those decisions, and corporations, of course, bought those places. And people think a lot more than you ever imagine about what gets placed where and why it gets placed where it does, and more and more and more beyond all that. That's just the most simple entry into the conversation. I was asked to speak at the end of the whole thing on could we speak about moral meaning in the marketplace? What about the idea of vocation in the marketing marketplace? I found myself you know, thinking again, you know, what does Jerusalem have to do with Athens? Well, you are students, aren't you? And you're studying economics, as I've heard from some of you, and business, some of you, and politics, some of you, and probably other majors in the room as well. But probably those dominate this room today. If Havel and Barry have been teachers to me, you know, Walker Percy's been one of my chief instructors over the years. And for lots of good reasons, his own life beginning, but then beginning to watch your heart and mine and the world at large, said, you know, it's possible to get all A's and still flunk life, isn't it? You really can be somebody who masters all the material and still, in fact, you know, flunk your life in the end, couldn't you? I've spent a lot of my life wondering about so what happens in somebody's life to push back against that temptation or tendency in your life and mine, to know a lot of stuff about all the things you're supposed to know, but somehow not really work it out in the way you live your life. 
if our educations are somehow to form our vocations in this world, we have to be people who learn to ask good questions. Because you see, good questions and learning to ask good questions, I would say, matters most in learning and life. I once counted how many questions there were in the book of Job. Almost all are asked by God himself, of course. You know, there are hundreds. There are just hundreds of questions that God asks. If you look at the primary pedagogy of Jesus, what is he doing mostly? He's asking questions, isn't he? He's asking questions, isn't he? I haven't met anybody in the world, really, who isn't actually willing to answer an honest question. I was someplace two nights ago, and we're talking to an 18-year-old who finished college, or finished high school in the area, and we talked for about an hour, and it seemed innocent and straightforward and simple to me, and his grandmother walked up to me about half an hour later and said, Steve, you know, he hasn't talked to any of us for two years like he talked to you tonight. And I thought, oh, I don't know, it wasn't magic. I wasn't, didn't feed him anything special. We just talked. I find that wherever I go, people actually want to be taken seriously. They just do. You do. I do. And so to learn to ask good questions actually is really important. For the Mars Corporation to be asking the questions it's asking about vocation, ethics, and meaning in a globalizing economy, they don't have to do that in one sense. And yet, as Wendell Berry put it to us, if you want to make money over 100 years, you're going to have to ask other questions. You see, for all of you, I would say, I don't have a neat list to say, well, it has to be this and this and this, but I would say to you, make sure that when you make your way through the disciplines of political theory and philosophy and politics and economics and business and on and on, that in fact, you are the person who is the primary agent for your education. I dropped out of school for two years, actually, after my sophomore year. I lived in communes in the Bay Area and in Europe for a couple of years. I had questions that college couldn't answer for me and I wanted some place to be able to answer them. I came back to school, though, with a deeper sense of what a vocation might mean to, as a student. Because I began to see that, in fact, if I was going to learn the things that really mattered, I had to be responsible for my own education. Now, I had teachers, and I loved them, and I learned from them. They told me, you should read this, Steve. You should read this, Steve. You should read this, Steve. And I read those books, and they formed my mind and heart, really. But you see, I began to see, that, in fact, that thus I began to be the primary agent the primary person responsible for what I was going to learn. No one else was going to take that for me and make it happen for me. We can get all A's and we can still flunk life. I have a very close friend to, our, to me personally, but also to our work in the Washington Institute. He's a CEO of a corporation in Kansas City that almost all of you in this room have bought something from, I would guess. They make about 7,000 things and they sell them all over the world. A few years ago, I wrote an essay about him, which you could find if you looked around on the internet, called Vocation Needs No Justification. Vocation Needs No Justification. But my friend David put it this way to me in a phone call one Friday night. He doesn't usually do this. He's a family person, has a full life. But he called me one Friday about 10 o'clock my time. He said, Steve, I'm just depressed. I said, what is it? And he said, well, I had one more conversation today with a 21-year-old. I have them about once a month. A parent will call me and say, Dave, would you please have lunch with my son, my daughter? She just finished at the University of, or they're just going off to their first job in, and if they could just meet you and talk to you first, wouldn't it? I mean, it'd be such a good, good gift. Would you please do that? And he says, I try to always say yes to these conversations. And so I do this once more, once more today. And one more time, I heard a variation on the same story. And the story was this. You see, I want a meaningful life, the 21-year-old said to my friend. And that's why I'm looking for work, for work in the nonprofit sector. Because, of course, somehow the assumption being that meaning, meaning is reserved for the nonprofit sector. You might use words like social justice or social entrepreneurship, or you can kind of pick your way to describe it these days. But at least somehow I'm in a discipline that matters to history, and therefore it has to be in the nonprofit sector. So, what could we do, Steve, to change this? to change the paradigm, to change the mind about this. I work at this in some ways all the time. And he and I have taken up a lot of projects together trying to do just that. I've put on your outline, you know, just a little note for you to look up more when you get home. But I came across an article this week that was called The Life and Death of a Master of the Universe. 
If that phrase doesn't ring bells for you, it's probably because you haven't read much of Tom Wolfe. But about a generation ago now, he wrote a novel called The Bonfire of the Vanities, about Wall Street and about these young, ambitious, gifted, skilled, passionate young traders on Wall Street who called themselves the master of, masters of the universe. Well, this is a story of one who committed suicide in December for after 25 or 30 years of being on Wall Street, making fortunes upon fortunes. He visited Africa at one point along the way and found himself thinking, I think I'm responsible for this somehow, some way. He didn't want to give money to, to be philanthropic about or towards. He said, I want to somehow use my Wall Street skills on behalf of Africa. So he began to invest in and to figure out ways to work with businesses in Africa and diverse countries and different kind of possibilities with you know, resources and minerals and you know, different kinds of things. Just think, how could I help these people here come into the 21st century themselves, developing infrastructures that would actually be sustainable over time? It's a longer story, and I'm not giving much detail here. But I want you to read with me you know, two things that I've included on the outline. The author of one essay about his death put it this way. It also illustrates how extremely successful entrepreneurs, even masters of the universe, can appear to lose all hope when their ideals slam into reality. These are hard words, aren't they? Their ideals slam into reality. And of course, it has to do a lot with what are the ideals, or maybe even better, what are the beliefs? What are the convictions? What are the, the hopes you have, in fact? Are they, in fact, grounded by the gospel of the kingdom in a way that it can make sense of life in a pluralizing, secularizing, globalizing world? We shouldn't be people who somehow are only idealistic. It isn't a word that I like very much at all, actually. Because you see, for most of us, the word ideal means not really real. Right? Sort of exist in a, a not real place in the world. Sort of romantic about, you know. Ideals about, the ideal of justice, you see. We could have a good conversation about the ideals of justice, couldn't we? Because, of course, it isn't really very real. In the real world, the real politic world, you, you can't really do it that way after all, can you? And, of course, ideals get somehow shelved into a place where not real things happen. Beliefs, commitments, dreams, hopes formed by the gospel of the kingdom, I think, in fact, we ought to give a lot of attention to that. But here's the second quote. What makes the whole thing sad is that in some ways he's emblematic of an emerging type of business person who understands that with power and wealth comes, comes responsibility, said Michael Santoro, an expert on business ethics at Rutgers Business School. He was a model of what we want business people to be like, but make no mistake about it, the kind of criticism he was facing is inevitable. We live in a world where we're expecting business to solve the problems that government are supposed to. Solve, supposed to. Now, dear friends, and the American Enterprise Institute, as we're meeting today. It's sort of a Rorschach test of the soul, isn't it? People who see the world that way and people who don't see the world that way. There's a lot of assumptions there at play in those few words. A lot of assumptions about how things happen in the world and who does them and why they happen and who's responsible for them. And you can see clearly in the world we live in today, especially the modern West, but in some ways, globally speaking, too, if you think about the last 150 years. There's been a debate, a very serious debate, with, with life consequences, life and death consequences over, in fact, who is responsible for the way the world turns out. I'm not going to make a political point here with you other than to say to you, you can see it here for yourselves and just think it through. I mean, is it really the answer to the future of the world that, in fact, governments are responsible for this and this and this and this? I've told you the stories of three of my friends. I could spend hours telling you the story of my friends in the marketplaces of the world. Whether it's Helen, though, whether it's Hans, whether it is my friends at the Marsh Corporation, you see, there are people who see somehow that the secret of man and women is our responsibility to think it through, to work it out, to be productive, to be enterprising. Well, one good way to work this out, and just very briefly to say to you, if you're not aware of the Praxis Labs or the Praxis Academy, you need to be. About four years ago, two very bright guys, Josh Kwan from San Francisco and Dave Blanchard from New York City, created the Praxis Labs. And in some ways, it is an opportunity just for you in this room, though others are clearly part of it these days. But they decided to create a business accelerator for both those who were in the nonprofit and the for-profit worlds. 
mostly 30-somethings, but from all over the world, a lot from the U.S., but from all over the world, are picked out each year, 12 people or projects each year, and they're seriously invested in by these people. We're part of it in the, in the Washington Institute. But giving time, attention, a very mentor-intensive pedagogy, it is. We're bringing world-class people in to think through how do you take an idea that's being worked out a little bit and give it the, the resources and ideas and hopes and people and all kinds of things to make this be over the long haul sustainable. It's very good work by very, very good people. And then for the very first time this summer, at, hosted by Gordon College, actually, will be the Praxis Academy. There'll be about 100 or so undergraduates like you guys here who are business interested, entrepreneurially interested, who are invited into this project. There's still some spaces left if you want to be part of it. I would just say it's the best thing going in some ways that I know about. People are trying to do the very kind of things we're talking about here out into the world for the rest of the world, for the sake of the world. You know what it means to find people sometimes who are very gifted by God, very, very gifted by God, and you think, ugh, you're a very gifted person, but you realize that it isn't about them. People like that I get drawn into, frankly. People are not driven by ambitions and egos. We're having to massage their own personalities, thinking, well, you're good at this, but sheesh, you're sure a big part of the story, aren't you? People I'm drawn to are people who are very gifted people, but who isn't, who have bigger dreams than simply their own per, you know, personal ambitions. The Praxis Labs is just like that. Well, a last thought for you. Washington Institute for Faith, Vocation, and Culture. Our thesis is simple. Our elevator speech is pretty simple, actually. Faith shapes vocation, which shapes culture for everyone everywhere. Faith shapes vocation, which shapes culture for everyone everywhere. We have five children, and one of them is Elliot. And he spent a lot of time overseas in the 20-something years of his life and spent a year in India on an NIH grant at one point, studying what happens when cows and humans drink from the same water sources. I visited him one time. We spent about a week just driving around the south of India. and I wasn't taking notes. I just noticed this. And the last day, going back to the airport, I said, Elliot, does Hindu culture produce hospitals? He said, with nuance and complexity, because he wasn't cheaply saying anything. He said, I don't think so, really, Dad. Well, why? I had my own ideas, but I wondered what he would think. He said, well, you see, the idea of karma is so strong in Hindu culture that, in fact, your karma doesn't implicate me with my karma. You're responsible yourself. That's your karma. That's your stuff to deal with in this life. And he said, I've met good and kind and thoughtful and compassionate Hindus this year. But you said, a set of ideas, karma, in fact, doesn't create hospitals. And so every hospital I saw in that week and a half of traveling with my son had a Christian symbol on it. It was either St. George's Hospital or St. Mark's Hospital or a Red Cross Hospital. And I thought, isn't it fascinating to see that, in fact, all throughout this part of India, every hospital has some Christian symbol on it. I'm not a very provincial person. I don't want to be a very parochial person. But I do believe that there are truest truths of the universe, and that somehow we are to be careful stewards of them, generous stewards of them. The secret of man is the secret of his responsibility. For love's sake, we're to see ourselves as responsible for the way the world turns out. I met Raf Etienne during the lunch break from Haiti, who's a student at Anderson University. We just talked for a few minutes, and he told me this, and in some ways, dear people, that's really a word for all of us as we leave today. He said to me, Haiti is on my shoulder. Haiti is on my shoulder. I'm studying this and this and this. But you see, my hope is, my plan is to go back to Haiti because you see, Haiti is on my shoulder. What is it that's on your shoulders today as you leave here now? What do you see yourself responsible for? What do you see yourself implicated by and in? That really is the question of vocation for any of us and all of us. Amen. Well, with that, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, if anyone has one of those, now's your chance. Darren, there was a student of mine years ago 
when he was a younger man. Yeah, ni- 91, I was a student of Steve's at ASP, so it's, it's good to see him after all these years. Uh, mine's kind of maybe a more practical question. Uh, this semester we read an essay by Vaclav Havel on morality and its role in politics, and um, I was just curious if you could recommend what, what, what's a good book to recommend on either on his writings or a good biography uh, yeah. of, of Havel. His yeah, it's a good question. I, I mean, there are, I would say to really know him well, maybe to read these speeches, because you really get a sense of you know, what he brought to bear in diverse settings all over the world. Um, it always makes sense to tell the truth is one volume of essays that I love very much, actually. It always makes sense to tell the truth. Um, some of you would like the work of Jean Beth K. Elstein, but you know that she really took his work quite seriously and wrote about him extensively. So if you'd like to have a very bright, brilliant, gifted interpreter of his work, Elstein was one of the best, I would say. Is there one more? I'll take liberty then to ask uh, Dr. Garber, Steve, if you might um, offer a best piece of advice, having sipped from a fire, ho- from a fire hose for, for two or three days on a, a range of, of subjects, your best piece of advice for using time on an airplane well. Maybe sleep, I don't know. Uh, uh-huh. Many I'm thanks, be- Steve Garber. Yeah. Let me say this, though, Josh. I met another young woman from Mexico who was a Biola student, and uh, she had just been reading the Visions of Vocation book, which was always a gift to me. I think probably the best gift as an author is to have somebody who's a serious person read your work seriously. So thank you for that. But uh, she talked about her own hopes from being an honor student at Biola University. She, of course, wants to go back to Mexico. She has Mexico on her heart, on her shoulders. Maybe it would be a good thing for all of you somehow as you doze your way back to, you know, Minneapolis or Indianapolis or Los Angeles or something. Somehow, just before the face of God in a quiet way to ask the question, so what am I implicated in now? And what have I learned these last few days? In fact, makes me more responsible than I was before I got here. Uh, What am I going to take on, you know, in God's name, for God's sake, for the sake of the world?